Great. Welcome everybody to the webinar. We're going to get started. Uh, I'm, many of you know me already. I'm Sean Morford. I tend to be the moderator for these third Thursday uh, webinars. I want to welcome everybody to it. Um, I'm really excited about this webinar because uh, I missed the session at Connect where these folks demoed this, uh, this tool. And so not only do we have it here today, but this will be recorded. So it'll be archived on the Network of Oregon Watershed Council's website. Um, today's webinar is going to be on uh, an open source technology called Project Tracker. We're going to do a little demo. Daniel's going to do a little demo for us. Um, and I won't say too much more about it because Matt and Daniel are going to be talking about it at great length. But um, So I'm the Executive Director of the Network of Oregon Watershed Councils. This uh, webinar is one of a series we do every third Thursday of the month, typically. And we can always do more webinars than that. So if you have topics or ideas, presenters, things that you want to share with each other, by all means, let's use this technology. We have the subscription for it, so let, let's use it. Um, we have two. We have 21 people on the call this morning. Um, glad to see everybody there. Not only land trusts and uh, conservation districts and, and watershed councils, but I see that there's quite a few partner organizations, and so you guys are more than welcome to sit in on these calls and participate, and we're glad to have you. Um, so our two presenters this morning, um, one is uh, Matt Denniston, uh, who is the managing partner of the Sitka Technology Group, and I asked him where his office was this morning, and he said downtown Portland. And Daniel Newberry, new office now, Daniel, for you, Johnson Creek Watershed Council Executive Director. Glad to have you both. I know Matt's going to give an introduction, and Daniel's going to run the demo for us because he's a user of this technology there at Johnson Creek. So <clears throat> just a couple of housekeeping things for folks that you've been on this before. You know how this works, but um, everybody is muted by default, but there's a couple of ways that you can intersect with the presenters. Uh, one is to raise your little icon hand, and that will alert me as your moderator to, um, to unmute you and let you ask your question. The other way is to type a question in the question box, and I'll be watching for those and look for the right time to, um, to interrupt our presenters and, um, and ask your question. So please feel free to make comments or ask questions. We'll try and capture those as we go along. We'll leave about 10 minutes at the end for, um, for any questions that, that may have arisen that you haven't asked so far. So there should be plenty of time to, to intersect. Um, there's a couple of handouts that you can download, and uh, I don't think they're the PowerPoint, are they, Matt? Um, Just a couple of PDF files, I think. Okay, so it's something that you might want to download after, after the presentation. Uh, one is a product sheet, and the other is sort of a case study. Um, example. Um, there's a short survey at the end of this, and I'm just going to beg you guys to please fill it out because it really is important for us to tell our funders the difference that these webinars make. If they want to keep, uh, if we want to keep the money flowing to do these, we need to tell stories about the difference. You don't have to make anything up, but <laughs> if it's valuable to you, uh, please take a second and let us know. Um, I mentioned that these sessions are recorded and they'll be posted, the link for it will be posted probably by Monday, I would say, on the Network of Oregon Watershed Council's uh, website for, for folks that haven't had a chance to see it. If you want to forward the link to them and so on, um, please feel free to do that. I think that's it on the introductions, and I'm just going to hand it over to, uh, to Matt to get us started. Thanks, Matt. Uh, well, thanks, Sean, and thanks to the network for allowing us to um, tell a little bit of our story here today, and thanks for folks that are uh, signed in. Um, got an agenda that's pretty simple, with quick introductions. I'm going to give you a, some history on the origins of the open source platform, um, and then Daniel's going to give an overview of the Clackamas Partnership and give a demo. Um, and we'll have time at the end for Q&A. If you guys have questions, as Sean said, um, certainly during this introduction, as I'm talking, um, please uh, fire away. 
So uh, for the past three and a half years, Daniel has been the executive director of the Johnson Creek Watershed Council. It's one of Oregon's most active watershed councils. Their restoration projects include fish passage improvements, managing a large citizen science program, planting tens of thousands of trees and shrubs each year. They have a noxious weed removal program, and they also manage one of the largest volunteer programs within the watershed councils in Oregon. Before becoming ED of Johnson Creek, Daniel was the ED of the Siskiyou Field Institute for four years. Uh, and I'm Matt Dennison, one of the founders, as Sean mentioned, of Sitka. Uh, Sitka is a technology and data management firm. Organizations that manage natural resources like watersheds uh, work with us when they're struggling to manage their own data, which often means they're tired of juggling dozens of spreadsheets and uh, they are looking for a better way to coordinate with their partners. They want more cost effective tracking of their activities and the ability to share the results in a more comprehensive and compelling way. So it's the type of uh, work we, we like to do. Uh, over the past 10 years, uh, we've enjoyed working with a wide range of organizations spanning large federal agencies, tribes, down to small local nonprofits. And then today uh, we'll be talking about work that we've done uh, first with the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency and then with the Clackamas Partnership. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of a background on the Environmental Improvement Program um, down in the Tahoe area. Um, the, the, the watershed, as many you probably know, straddles the boundaries of two states, Nevada and California. And uh, there was a bi-state compact which established the, the agency in the late 1960s and mandated that uh, they pursue the achievement of environmental standards including water quality, soil conservation, and air quality, scenic quality. Um, and then in the 1990s, it became clear um, that the regulations alone wouldn't achieve those goals. Um, and so then in 1997, the Tahoe Basin came together, um, all the various uh, parties and agencies around the lake to establish the Environmental Improvement Program. So this is a uh, public-private uh, capital improvement program designed to achieve those uh, environmental goals. There's hundreds of projects that have com been completed. Um, they're pretty close to actually having their 1,000th project uh, in the system and track. There's been about $2 billion invested since 1997. And uh, a big part of how they track their work is a set of 34 performance measures um, that they determined were indicators for um, achieving their environmental goals. Uh, and they've got about 50 implementers, partners around the lake. Um, so uh, it was, for many years, it was difficult coordinating and collating information from all of them. Um, and so um, in 2014, TRPA decided they need a better way. They were tired of their juggling of spreadsheets. And um, so they went out to RFP and we ended up um, being hired to build out this environmental improvement uh, project tracker. So it's a web-based platform with some key workflows where project implementers can log in and propose projects and update information about their ongoing projects. And it also automatically sums up accomplishments um, and, and summarizes the funding and funding sources. So uh, now the EIP project tracker is, is part of this larger platform that I'm showing here on the screen called the Lake Tahoe Info. Um, the platform provides transparent access and collaboration on a wide range of things from transportation planning to TMDL management to daylighting some of the regional monitoring data. Um, today, we're just gonna focus on the open source version of the EIP project tracker, which is shown here. I'm taking a couple screenshots to walk you through this experience, but um, uh, this, this, for example, is the homepage, which allows you to explore projects and highlights some of the key projects that they've implemented over time. Um, a recap of the, the more recent timeline. Um, in 2014, we started working on it. A few months later, they were starting to use it internally. Um, and uh, the first priority was to streamline the process for partners to provide annual updates. And so um, the first time they ran through that um, annual process was in January. And, um, and then over time, we did things like add, improve the capabilities so folks to add GIS 
uh, files, upload GIS files and update the project location. Um, and kind of just responded to people's feedback as they started to use it and, and made sure that they were getting what they wanted out of it as well. Uh, and then in uh, 2016, TRPA put a reciprocal open source license on the technology so that other agencies and programs could leverage their investment but also to contribute their own investments so that everyone um, using the platform, the community would build up around it and um, everyone would benefit from it. So this type of open source model has been used in Silicon Valley boardrooms and garages for years. Um, it's been the same model behind Linux operating system and Firefox web browser, some of the more maybe um, household names or brand names you may be familiar with. Um, but TRPA really broke new ground by applying it to the, at the regional government level. So hats off to TRPA for their strategic benevolence. Um, this, uh, putting the open source license on it inspired us to contribute some of our own resources to take the code that was in the, that behind the EIP project tracker and um, extract it so that it was more configurable and would work for other programs other than TRPA. So technically speaking, we created a multi-tenant application to make it easier, quicker, cheaper for others to start using it. And then in 2017, we started uh, to see just that. Other organizations started to adopt it and help them track their program accomplishments. Um, and, uh, and today we're here to talk about the Clackamas Partnership was actually the first um, organization um, to start using it. So, a uh, quick recap, what started as a public investment in Lake Tahoe was, uh, has also been used to ensure sustainable land practices throughout California. That's what the California RCD project tracker. Um, it's now helping restore forest in Colorado's Front Range with an organization called Peaks to People. And then um, is helping protect salmon in the Willamette Valley. This is the, the story of uh, the Clackamas Partnership and what Daniel's going to talk a little bit more about. So Daniel, I think uh, that's my cue to hand it off to you. Okay. Um, so just a, a little bit about um, why my watershed council is interested in getting involved in this. We like many of our the other councils around the state, we have an action plan. Uh, the slide you see now just shows the different uh, pieces of what we do. Uh, living in an urban area, we have a really big uh, volunteer program. Uh, we do fish passage, a lot of uh, riparian planting, some water quality, including stormwater work, um, wildlife protection through citizen science, and um, sharing information with other organizations. So next slide. Um, so uh, can we get the next slide? Okay, thanks. So the Clackamas Partnership, what is it? Um, I think a lot of the folks in this uh, webinar today um, were interested in folks investment partnership funding from OWEB. And that's really um, how our partnership got together. There are four watershed councils. Um, in addition to our council, there's uh, the Clackamas River Basin Council, the Oregon, uh, Great Oregon City Watershed Council, and North Clackamas Urban Watershed Councils. And, you know, we when we were getting together to do the, the partnership, one of the original things we, we talked about was with a focus investment partnership, you're going to have be proposing a lot of projects. And we really needed a way to organize the projects. Um, and we heard about this uh, piece of software from the facilitator that we were going to hire to facilitate putting our, our application to OEB for the FIP together and came across uh, the Clackamas partnership, uh, came across the Sitka technology. And I wanted to just say a bit about a, being a user. So this is really an enterprise level uh, piece of software. And by enterprise level, what I mean is, as opposed to uh, pieces of software that an individual uses or even uses together within one watershed council, this is a piece of software that you can use across multiple agencies. Um, and it's a way of looking at what's going on in your 
larger regional area um, remotely, not having to get together all the time to, to talk about it, although that's part of what we do as a partnership. But really with this piece of software, you can sign on, you can see what other watershed councils, what other agencies are doing um, in your region. Now, as a little bit of background, the Focus Investment Partnership application that we all just submitted in June is for native fish restoration. I think that's probably um, an interest of most of the folks here um, listening in the webinar. And um, let's see, the, the main parts of this software are you can track um, your projects, you can develop projects, you can um, see the projects as they're developing. And um, what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna give you a demonstration of this project because I think um, you, know, you can probably hear me talk forever and ever and it's kind of gonna sound a little bit abstract um, until we get into it. So uh, I don't know how many of you were involved with Watershed Councils back around 2005, 2006, but back then, OWEB kind of put out this mandate that all the watershed councils in the state were going to have to, um, at a regional basis, look at what they called limiting factors. What was limiting um, anadromous fish uh, production populations? And so I was uh, in the Rogue Basin. Oh, let's please go back to the other slide. Um, so what we, what we looked at um, was trying to figure out, like I said, limiting factors. And we were all working at a regional level. There really wasn't any simple piece of software back then we could get together to use to, to track projects and to look at limiting factors. But um, this piece of software makes it easier. On the current slide, um, this is the, um, the project area that we have. So let's see if my, hopefully you can see my pointer here. These are all six field watersheds, which is really a common planning uh, unit size for watershed councils and agencies. And, um, you know, large part of this is the Clackamas River Basin. But I think it's important to point out the way we kind of or organize things in terms of looking at native fish restoration had to do with the uh, Columbia River Plan for, for restoration that ODFW put in, Lower Columbia River Plan. And the Clackamas Partnership represents an area within the uh, Lower Columbia River Evolutionary Significant Unit, ESU, and it's a population that. So we're looking at restoration for that part of this ESU. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, yeah. Next slide, limiting factors. As you can see from, from this um, slide, the limiting factors, and you have to set it up um, when you're setting up your, your software to application here, you have to set up the different limiting factors you're interested in. So as you can see here, um, it goes from anything from, um, you know, fish passage here under impaired upstream uh, passage to down here, you know, degraded channel riparian area, habitat quality, that kind of gets it, you know, lim uh, large wood projects, things like that. Water temperature, so you get at your riparian projects. And just a number, you can, it's totally um, uh, customizable. You can add as many as you want. Um, so next slide, please. So the limiting factors, that's one of the basic pieces here that we're looking at. The next one is the focal species. So as we went to plan this, we looked at what were the different native fish species that we are interested in providing restoration for. And you see, these are, these are the ones we have, um, seven of them. And an interesting thing to notice, if you look under each one, let's say here on bull trout, there's 16 projects in our project database um, that have to do with bull trout restoration. Next slide, please. And um, then this comes up all the time. Those of you who are familiar with um, 
Google Web Grants, and I'm going to assume that's 100% of the people watching this. You know that performance measures are a big uh, part of what we have to report on. For grant evaluators, they're going to want to know how are you going to determine project success? What are you, what are you going to be doing in terms of uh, quantifying the results? The next slide. Uh, next slide, please. So here's just an example. Oh, that went away. Okay. Um, so this is just an example of one of the screens that will come up. Um, and this shows you for this performance measure, large wood placement, um, and shows you a graph over time. So we're going to go ahead and do a demo because I think, you know, having me just talk about this is, is kind of limited. I'm going to do a demo of the, the project here, project software, so you can see. So let me go to my screen. Whoops. Clock I think you crash. have. Okay. Yeah. Dan, great. you have to there accept the presenter. So yeah. got, got our screen. Um, this is. Let's see, hide this. Here we go. Okay, good. Um, here's our screen. And these are the different agencies that are involved. As you can see, so four watershed councils, a lot of the regional governments, um, different levels of government here. So the basic uh, part of this, let's go to the project. Uh, we'll start off. One of the neat features here is we have a project map and what you can do, and I'm going to zoom in here, is at a glance, you can see where all the different projects are. Uh, they're, they're different color coded projects. So for instance, if I click on this dark blue project, this is a project that's already been completed. Some of the lighter colored ones are proposed projects. So um, I think it might be interesting to note here that when we put this together, this is primarily for us about uh, the focus investment partnerships. And so we have quite a few projects here that are proposed projects, and that's what the light colored projects are. So let's now look at the full project list. Really the bread and butter of this whole piece of software is that it's a project database and for instance, here you're seeing um, a full list of projects. These are the completed projects that have been put in because we thought for um, just for purposes of um, what the public can see and other agencies, we, we wanted to have a series of completed projects, but it's worth pointing out, and I think this is a really cool feature of the project, is that you're not gonna wanna have everybody in the world seeing all of your proposed projects because they're in various stages of planning. And, and therefore, what you would see as somebody just browsing the internet, you would see this list right here. But if you're signed in as a member of this partnership, then you could look at, for instance, proposals. So let's see. Okay, hold on. Here we go. Okay, so we have 67, and this represents all the projects at this point that are in the Focus Investment Partnership application that we put in, all 67 projects. So, for instance, if we were going to, let's say, you wanted to know um, North Clackamas Urban Watershed Council, let's look at their list of projects. Whoops. So, they've got five projects in here. Um, and you can narrow it down there. Um, so let's go through looking at a, at a specific project. So if we click on the add project tab, um, you can either add a proposal for a future project. That's what you do as we're uh, looking for funding, or you can enter existing projects. And realistically, although we're using this as a piece of software to look at future projects for future funding. 
You can also use this to go back in time as much as you want to enter a database of existing projects. And that can be extremely helpful um, for agencies, watershed councils. Hey, what's been done nearby? Let me click. And then you go into map view and you can look at it. So let's say add a future project. Um, wanted to show you this, show you how simple this really is to enter a project. Um, so you'd start off, and if you remember that limiting factors page that I showed you before, you just go down and you, you select. Um, and for this, let's, let's look at a culvert project since that's um, one of the major types of projects my council does. So we click on road crossing and uh, let's type a project name here. Um, Veterans Creek I-205 culvert, because of course that's a huge project that has not been proposed yet because it's so expensive. We're not going to take part I-205, but, um, you know, just to enter something here about um, and <clears throat> come down here. Is this a capital project or an operations and maintenance project? And by that, um, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that you could have projects that are not necessarily capital projects, and then there'll be a different set of things you, you would enter for the project. So, well, let's see. Big projects, million dollars. Well, we may not have such a great chance of getting it funded, but let's put it in here. Um, other things to do here, let's say it's gonna be starting the plan in 2018. We'd like to implement it in uh, 2021. Maybe it'll take an entire year, 2022. So I'll say save and continue. Um, and then in here, you know, you, um, you come in and you, you specify where the project is located. Um, we'll plot a point on a map. Really pretty easy. Um, you know, might come in here and say, ah, here's I-205. Here's our project area. Um, and we'll keep going. Uh, Okay, I didn't plot it. So I'm gonna, for now, I'm just gonna say no location, continue. Uh, it's not gonna let me get through. Um, if you have to put a, a note, if there's no location, or you can just plot a point on the map real quick. For, okay, just click okay. on the map there. Do that. Yep, that'll do All it. All right, so. Um, so I think we're going to skip through this. This is just plotting the locations. Um, yeah, that's an that's an optional step where you can draw on the map or you can upload a GIS file to to provide a more detailed location for your project. Right. So select watersheds. Um, okay. To be filled in later. And. So as you see, there, there are a number of different screens that we can keep going at an implementer. Um, your performance measures, you know, on this particular one, we're looking at um, roads, side channels, stormwater, stream habitat accessible. We're gonna add that and barrier type. Uh, let's say this is a complete barrier, fish can't get by. We're going to uh, open up to steelhead. Let's say, we'll say 2.0 miles. And so as you can see, it's really easy just to add these different performance measures. Um, we'll say save and continue. Um, how are we going to fund this? Um, which interesting thing to 
uh, point out is you you actually have to add potential funders in advance. And this one will say a web FIP and um, estimated cost. Then you get down to the focal species. Which um, species is this going to benefit? Well, we'll check coho. We'll check Pacific lamprey. Uh, let's see. We'll do steelhead and then you could, this is the point where you would add maybe your pre-project photos um, of this particular culvert. Um, keep going. Um, you can add any notes and it's important to add notes, I think, because if you're gonna have your partners looking at this and your partners are, you know, for, for uh, like a focus investment partnership, we had a huge process that took many, many months where we would all kind of prioritize the projects. So this is your opportunity to enter in uh, a variety of notes, um, why this is a good project, et cetera, et cetera. And at this point, I would then click submit. Um, I wanna go back now to, to our full project list because I wanna show you a feature of this um, software that I think is one of the most powerful. And I'm going to pull up a, a project that our Watershed Council did. I actually manage this project personally, um, so probably be a good one to do. But it has this feature called a fact sheet. Now, you're going to want to be able to promote individual projects to a variety of funders. You know, even if you're doing a FIP, OWEB is not going to be your only funder. So here's all the, you can see on the screen, all the different pieces of the project, but we all have spent how many hours, I don't know, putting together like uh, project proposals where we have to like show all the basic information in a nice way, make it attractive for the funders. This software does it for you. Click on view fact sheet. And for this particular project, this is what comes up. It shows you all, um, the name, all the basics, limiting factors, um, all the notes that you'd put in there about the project. Um, this gets down to some of the limiting factors. What are the focal species? It shows you a map. Where is this project located? Um, expenditures. Um, in this case, you can see, you know, OWEB on this project was only through a small grant, but we had other funding. And then you see here we have before and after photos, what the crossing looked like and then what it looks like now. This is a, a really, really important uh, feature of this project is the fact sheet. So I'm going to pause slightly now and Sean, I'm going to ask you, um, Anybody have any questions so far, or if anybody would like to ask questions before we keep going, I know I've been throwing a lot at you. Um, let's see if there are any questions right now. Yeah, we can pause for a second and wait for some questions to come in, but I have a couple questions, and maybe you're gonna to get to this, Matt, uh, later. But um, oh, go the ahead. big question is, um, you know, what does this thing cost? How do you get it? And should is this useful for individual watershed councils, or is it really just a collaboration tool among across across a number of organizations? So those are the two questions that I would put forward, and I welcome anybody to to add other questions as well. Oh, okay, good questions. Um, I'd like to wait until the demo's done and hand it back to Matt, and he can talk about the the cost. But I, I want to address the, the second question. Um, just as a user, I don't think this would be as valuable for a single watershed council, although you could. I think it's the real power of it is to have multiple organizations being able to look at a particular regional geography that they're all um, working in um, so you can enter things remotely. Um, this could be a great way to save on meetings too. I mean, uh, if you have this piece of software where you can look at this online and even have a, a phone call, I mean, just something as simple as what's on the screen now. I mean, let's talk about this particular project. Let's review it. You can 
review it among different agencies. I would say though, I think if you are in a, a really big geography watershed, I mean, let's, let's say for instance, the, uh, the Umpqua River, I know they have a big technical advisory committee with a lot of different agencies all looking at their, their projects together. I could see that working for that watershed, but I think, you know, smaller watershed councils probably would not be as valuable. I, I, I really do think this is, um, this is good as a, a solution for that big enterprise level software. Great, thank you. Any other questions come up? I am not seeing any at the moment. Uh, the lines are open <laughs> if anybody wants to ask a question. Uh, as we said, there'll be time at the end if you have other questions that have come up in the meantime. But I'm not seeing any. Daniel, should I hand it back over to Matt now? Or are you? Okay, just a, a couple more things I wanted to mention um, as a user of this software. Um, Matt talked a little bit about how the initial project um, for this was down in the Lake Tahoe region. So I will say one of the things that I like is the fact that we were not the first users. So the Lake Tahoe people actually were the guinea pigs. They got to have all the bugs worked out, um, which is <coughs> really good for us. But one point about Matt mentioned the, the open source. Uh, part of the software. One of the really th important things that we've benefited a little bit from so far, and we will in the future, is that when other users um, ask for new features, which happens all the time, we actually asked Matt uh, for features as we went along to help customize it for our use, is that those features get put in and then every other user gets access to those new features. So you're really part of a, a restoration community around the country here. Um, all these different groups that are using the software as they test it and they might find a little tweak they might um, want to put in, uh, maybe a bug fix or a new feature. Because it's open source, um, you're going to get access to that. So that's been that's been really helpful. Um, so really, you know, you're building on other users' experience. So I guess that's the other thing I wanted to mention why, why we really like it. And um, at this point, I will pass the baton on to Matt. Okay. Thanks, Daniel. I think you're going to show my screen again here. So I think, um, Daniel, did you... Did you cover the conclusions that you wanted to cover there? I, I think you might have, but uh, I think we there were some notes on um, on training considerations and and some features that you uh, maybe were still looking for that you wanted to just to share with folks. Um, I've got I've got those notes here. I can cover those if that's easier. Yeah, I mean we we've, we've talked as a group about some potential new features. But at this point for what we were doing, which was to get this ready for a focus investment partnership application, I think we, you know, we had all the features, features we needed, but there certainly are some that we'd be interested in. Okay. But go ahead. Um, so yeah, some of the um, training considerations that you guys ran into one was um, um, that, that when you did demos to a group, they, they, only went so far and uh, so that one of the things that you that guys said you might do over is leverage recorded training videos um, and I know that um, that idea came out of our the work with the stand up the Clackamas partnership tracker and then the very next organization to start using it was a group of uh, resource conservation districts spanning the state of California and they ended up doing a bunch of training videos um, which are now available to everyone else. So we made some some progress there. Um, another uh, thing that you had talked about is that one of the benefits of being an open source platform is that you have this community that builds up around it and you get to share in the investments. And one of the, uh, I think, ones that the Clackamas Partnership benefited from was the, the California RCDs um, also um, invested in creating a, an alternative pr 
project fact sheet that was more focused on a proposed project. Um, and that, uh, instead of saying, what did you accomplish? It said, you know, what do you plan to accomplish? Instead of saying, what did you expend? It says, where do you, what kind of funding have you got lined up? What's still the unfunded need? And um, I know from talking with others in the Clackamas Partnership, you guys leverage those funding fact sheets heavily in your most recent FIP application. Okay. Good. I need to elaborate on that, but um, I know that was um, was a was a, a boon to to your application was to have that functionality in there. Um, so I think those are the the main conclusions. Uh, I wanted to. We have a uh, get back to my mouse here. The question was, and we have a, a slide prepared for the, how much does it cost? So we jump to that. Uh, so there's a there's an annual application management service um, that we uh, charge just to cover the, the cost of running it and keeping it up to date and. All this stuff that you get with a cloud hosted application, backups and real time monitoring and all that kind of stuff. That's all bundled into that application management service for $10,000 a year. And we actually give 25% uh, of that back to Tahoe Regional Planning Agency to offset their future costs because of kind of as a thank you for their investment in the initial platform. And then what we found is it usually takes about $20,000 to get an initial setup, and that's a lot of consulting, like how to set up those the limiting factors uh, tree, if you will, that, that Daniel showed, or and the different classifications. We don't have time to get into it today, but the system allows you tremendous flexibility for setting these things up and customizing it. And there's some, some good ways and some bad ways of doing that, and we often sit down and talk through the options and identify the best ways to configure the system to meet an individual program's reporting and analysis needs. Um, and then there's often some um, data migration desired where you've got um, X number of spreadsheets or other older databases that have your historic projects that you might want to move in. Now for the Clackamas Partnership, didn't have that. They ended up just entering in the 13 or so uh, completed or ongoing projects that Daniel showed you. So that's an optional cost and then there's um, of course custom feature development that may or may not happen depending on your needs. Hey, hey Matt, um, just wanted to jump in on this cost thing because I think for a lot of councils, individual councils, they might have sticker shock here. So, yep. and you're probably wondering, well, how did, how did all of us afford to do this? So as you know, um, OWEB has a specific grant program um, for applying for FIP applications, right? They have the, the application and then the actual funding um, program. So what we did is when at the Clackamas Partnership, when we put in our initial application to develop a fo focus investment partnership, we put funding in that application for this initial setup and, and all of that. So that's how we got, we got started um, in terms of the ongoing maintenance. Um, we now have a lot of different organizations involved, so especially with agencies. This is why you don't want to just fund this with one watershed council. We're able to, um, you know, get everybody to kind of share in the cost. So that's kind of the, the way we were doing it. And um, hopefully that makes it sound like it's a little more affordable for folks. It's just, you know, another reason why this is kind of this multi-agency uh, application rather than an individual council. Um, right. Matt, there, <clears throat> there's a question related to that, um, which is, since this is open source with multiple different groups using the system, how, how is individual organization data handled? So, yeah, it's a great, great question. There, uh, it's a what we call a multi-tenant application, and that the analogy actually works reasonably well if you think about an apartment building where everyone's got their own apartment, um, they share in common infrastructure electrical and plumbing and, um, and, and uh, heating and cooling and stuff like that. But, uh, and, and so that's the, the, the functionality within the system, the workflows, the, the user experience that you see is, the, the functionality behind that is shared. But each tenant has the ability to customize their, what it looks like inside. So 
um, and the structures of how information is organized. And then the data on the back end also shares a common schema um, so that the way data is organized and stored is common, but the data itself is specific to each individual tenant or each individual customer that's using it. And today so we've these got are individual databases. Yeah, well, right. technically it, it, it is, uh, it's, it's one common database, but the tables are segregated and separated out so that you can, you know, for example, if you wanted to get all of your data out in one click, you can do that in the system. You could also say, I just want the projects or I just want the organization list. Um, so we've made a lot of efforts to make it as easy as possible to get your data out if you want to take a look at it offline or if you said you wanted to stop using this platform and migrate that data to some, someplace else, you could do that within a few clicks. Uh, there's another question. How long does it take to get a project tracker like this set up and ready to use? Yeah, um, it, of course it depends on how ready the organization is to work through those conversations about how to set it up to meet their needs. Um, the, the, the most recent one that we did for uh, the state, for the Idaho Soil and Water Conservation Commission, it's a statewide organization with lots of different soil and water conservation districts within it. And uh, we started that in June, and late June, and we have, we're pretty much done with that now. Uh, so it's, a, it was like six to eight weeks. And now they're up and running with their own project tracker. And that timeline was about the same for the California uh, Resource Conservation Districts as well. Yeah, and I'll say from, from our perspective, it maybe took a little bit longer, but part of that was just um, because we had to get, had to light a fire under some people to get their projects put in the database. Well, um, you notice which, I didn't you know, talk about- well, that's, that's typical. <laughs> but, um, I'll just say, you know, as a user, um, I probably had to spend maybe, uh, I'm going to say four or five hours messing around with the software before I, I started to feel comfortable. So it's not like it's, it's going to take you 20, 30, 40 hours to learn this. As you saw with entering the, the project, it's a pretty, pretty easy thing to, to look at, to, to use, to learn how to use. Um, also, another thing you might be interested in, um, they've set it up for, for two types of users. So um, you can be just a regular user or an administrator. And as an administrator, there are several things you can do to manage the software. And that's important for all of us because you don't want to have to call Matt every time you want to do every little thing. So more and more there are, yeah, okay. Uh, more and more there are things that administrators can do in this software. And, you know, that takes a little more training too, but in general, it's, you know, it's pretty easy to use like any software it can take a few hours to of investment of your time, but it's not really that difficult. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked if you had any recommendations on how to get users to use a system, but then they said, maybe you've already answered it. Well, part of it is, hey, we've got a FIP application deadline coming up and it's really going to take all of us if we want to have a fighting chance of, of getting this grant. <laughs> yeah, the, the, um, Daniel highlighted it, but one of the things that we learned with the very first EIP project track for Tahoe was that this fact sheet actually ended up being a pretty good motivator, not just because of what you get out of it, but it created a little bit of competition that folks wanted to have their project look um, as good, if not better, than than their other their colleagues in the in the basin, and so what we that the system actually requires very little data that has to be inputted in, or updated in a project update, and there's a lot that's optional. And found that people put a lot of optional data in there. I think for the same reason, it's just uh, they wanted their projects to, to look good and continue to impress their funders and their stakeholders. And we and also question. Done, Go ahead, Matt. Sorry. I was just going to say we also have done things to make it easier for folks to get up and running by adding training videos. And now each individual, there's some training videos that um, are, are kind of generic, and then there's now a capability in the system for each individual program to add in their custom training videos that's specific to their programs that might do things like walk you through the limiting factors list that Clackness Partnership uses. 
as opposed to the conservation practices uh, taxonomy or hierarchy that the conservation districts use. Uh, do you have another question there? Cut you off. Are there any other questions? The lines are open. Questions? Well, I would I would I just offer um, if anybody has any questions later, um, please feel free to just give me a call here at my watershed council office. That I'm happy to answer questions. Great. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions, uh, but Daniel, you want to give folks your phone number, or I guess you've got your email here uh, on the screen. People just can drop you a, an email and ask. Okay. Great. Well, with that, I'm going to thank Matt and uh, Damon Knight. You're in the background also, so thank you for, from Sitka. And, uh, and Daniel for taking the time to show this tool to us. Um, it's very, very inspiring and it kind of makes you wonder how we did it before <laughs> um, if, when we had these large collaborative efforts. So um, very good to know about. Okay, I'm just gonna ask if there's any last questions. If not, we'll just thank you and um, remind everybody to um, fill out the short survey at the end. Again, it's really important for us to tell funders uh, the difference that uh, these webinars make. And so people are typing in thank you, Daniel and Matt. Welcome. And uh, we quick commercial for upcoming webinars. We're still working on them, but we've got one on Tidegates coming up in November important for everybody across the state, even those folks who aren't on the coast. Uh, looks like we'll do one in December on stormwater and low impact development. We've got one on beaver dam analogs coming up in the, um, in the new year and another one on zero stage restoration probably in March. So keep uh, watching your email for announcements on future um, sessions. Thanks for all the information. Great webinar. Thank you very much. Hey, Sean. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sean, question. You you mentioned the upcoming webinars. Do you ever send out emails that show like a, a what all the future ones are, not just the next one? Uh, well, we don't get them organized fast enough to do that. <laughs> oh, I was just wondering because some of those sounded <laughs> like they're really interesting topics. It would be cool to know like three you know for the next three months what the topics are mm -hmm. yeah as soon as i get titles i i will send out as as soon as we get a title we'll send it out for sure cool just working on getting that set up but good 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 comment all right thanks everybody i'm going to end the webinar now um we'll talk to you all in a little next month thanks for having us thank thanks. you so much